Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, once again, um, I'm Charles Steinkuhler, and uh, this time we're going to talk about uh, platforms. Um, before I do that, I wanted to mention um, uh, I had a bunch of stickers made, uh, machine kit logo. They're on the little table by the door for anybody. If you haven't gotten one, uh, or if you'd like one, or you want to take a bunch more, there's I have hundreds because you order them online and you get large quantities. Uh, so help your, help yourself. Uh, let's see. So uh, basically, just platforms this time. Not uh, not so complicated as as the real time synchronization stuff last time. Um, current platforms uh, x86. Uh, uh, a lot of people, I think, uh, think of Machine Kit uh, and think of me as like the ARM guy, I guess. And Machine Kit is an ARM project. Uh, that's sad because uh, x86 machines actually were really awesome. And uh, probably, if you just want to run a machine, one of the best choices you could make. Um, uh, I don't have a nice little picture here. There's there's too many machines to even consider. You probably don't want a laptop, but uh, there's everything from uh, things like the Edison up to full blown conventional AT x86 machines. Uh, lots of little miniature versions, 12 volt powered versions for car entertainment, all all sorts of things. Um, parallel ports work pretty well with most. Modern systems for uh, software stepping. Uh, it'll give you an okay performance on a decent machine, but uh, if you spend a little bit of money and buy uh, something to assist uh, in, in the way of hardware, uh, can hook up with PCI, PCI Express, uh, some EPP type uh, uh, connections, you'll get really good performance. And uh, Basically, you've got tons of power. You got great GPUs, uh, good displays, all sorts of wonderful good things, um, and they're not very expensive um, overall. Uh, but the ARM boards are fun. Um, I started with the BeagleBone uh, because I wanted something to control my 3D printer, and it's a small desktop type system. Or uh, we've got there's the Pocket NC here that. Uh, uh, is on display, which is awesome. It's got a Beagle Bone running it. And uh, there are some, but not a whole lot, of x86 machines that would fit inside of that uh, or uh, you know, not seem out of place next to it. Uh, something like one of the Tormach machines, you don't even notice so x86 computers. You can hide it any number of places inside the machine cabinet that we've got. You have to have for your servo amps and all that stuff anyway. Uh, you're talking about a small little 3D printer. It's a, it's another story. Um, so I was looking for something that was more like an Arduino type uh, board, but uh, had uh, enough power to run Linux. Uh, the Beagle board specifically happens to be great. There's a PRU, which is the programmable real time unit. Um, it's great for uh, timing critical uh, tasks. Uh, John talked about how he can control his photo plotter with it. You do exactly the same thing to do software generated PWM and step direction. Uh, works really, really well. It doesn't work as well as hardware. If you plug the hardware card into your x86 machine, it's going to be far better than even the PRUs. Uh, however, it works uh, as well or better than the uh, best software step generation on the x86 platforms. Um, in addition, the Beagle board is an industrial processor. It has some hardware. Uh, there's CAN hardware on there. There's a uh, hardware encoder and hardware PWM support, which are supported with uh, machine kit. There's uh, HAL drivers for those. Uh, poor graphics performance. There's a GPU built into the core, but it's it's closed source. It's a black box. Uh, there are some GPU drivers available, but if you aren't running Android, they're basically uh, very difficult to use, and that generally hasn't hasn't happened yet. But other than the GPU, the design is essentially an open design. There's data sheets. There's uh, uh, data sheets for the processor, design files for the PC board, etc. Available. Um, also, currently, <coughs> the ARM platform. Uh, we have Raspberry Pi one and two. Uh, Michael mentioned Raspberry Pi uh, in the future is going away. It's not a great platform for to use today anyway. It's It's got good GPU performance, but it's kind of hard to interface a, a Pi to uh, 
stepper motors and physical things. Uh, the chipset on the Raspberry Pi is basically comes out of the set-top box market, uh, DVDs, Blu-ray players, uh, cable TV boxes, and things like that. That's basically what it's designed for. It's high-end GPUs glued to enough ARM cord or on Linux is a great way to think of a Raspberry Pi. Uh, if you want to do media applications and play <coughs> movies and audio and video games, uh, they rock. If you want to physically move motors and interface to the real world, and eh, not so much. You're better off with a Beagle Bone or, or something else. Uh, they're also very black box. Uh, you can, I believe, get um, board level details on the Raspberry Pi, but uh, all of the fun stuff, which is inside the CPU, you basically don't get to see anything of. Uh, you have to sign non-disclosures with Broadcom and do. Uh, you, you can't actually see anything about what's inside the, the CPUs and the SOC. So uh, anyway. Then uh, also currently, we have the uh, smart hardware. That's what I was talking about, uh, like the systems John makes uh, for uh, step direction, analog servos, encoders, uh, things like that. Uh, Masonet's another company that makes some of that. Uh, I'm not sure. There's probably some other people. I'm, I don't know if there's anyone else that makes things that directly talks to Linux CNC, but uh, uh, could be. Uh, they generally uh, offload the timing critical portions, uh, talking to the encoder signals, generating PWM, step direction, uh, analog outputs, analog inputs, things like that. Uh, you connect them up with uh, uh, smart buses, EPP, PCI Express, uh, Ethernet. Also, I think sort of lumped into there, I didn't add to the slide, but uh, there's the field bus systems. Um, including EtherCAT, uh, including CAN bus, um, uh, can open. Um, uh, that's very exciting to me as well. That sort of blurs the line between. Uh, it's not something like uh, uh, the Masonet cards or what John makes, where you've got a, a smart piece of hardware talking to HAL with a HAL driver uh, that's then controlling a dumb servo amp. Uh, it's sort of a mix of um, the servo amp and the smarts are built together, and you talk to that with a communications link. Um, and uh, that actually, I think, is a pretty nifty uh, way to approach things. Uh, industrial automation and factory automation has been doing that for years. Uh, we haven't seen much of that take hold in the open source realm, but I think that I, I think that's a great fit for machine kit, and I'm uh, I'm hoping that we head that way uh, more in the future. Uh, and again, when you start doing this stuff in hardware, you get the best performance uh, possible. Uh, better even you know better than PRUs, better than uh, dedicating a core to software step gen, anything like that. So that's sort of what's available today. Then we get into uh, what is coming down the road. Um, and multi-core. I put that up here because um, at the moment that's one of the things that's beginning to significantly differentiate uh, machine kit from uh, where we started with the fork from Linux CNC in uh, the multi-core capable HAL. Um, x86 machines have generally been multi-core for quite a while now. Even your laptops, just about just about anything x86 has more than one core in it now. It's hard to find. I think you can buy some single core atoms or maybe some of the processors targeted for tablets or something, but almost any x86 machine, it's not just the absolute rock bottom, lowest dollar cost performance thing is going to have two or four cores in it. Um, even the ARM systems, um, cell phones and all the tablet processors for ARMs have two cores, four cores, eight cores. Um, ARM has what they refer to as big little, and it's uh, actually, yes, typed that way. The big is in little letters, and the little is in big letters, and I'm sure that's probably a million dollar marketing idea from somebody. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they are uh, mixing uh, not just multiple cores, uh, but um, things like uh, A15 cores with uh, maybe an A7, a couple of A7s, uh, where you can essentially control your system power profile by uh, which cores you have awake and running at any given time. Um, and they're also mixing different flavored cores in terms of not just a faster core with a slower core, but uh, the Cortex-A and the Cortex-M, uh, both... Uh, 
I want to say Motorola, but it's but it Motorola alternative Freescale. Uh, the Freescale has one of their IMX parts that has Cortex A and Cortex M, and uh, TI has numerous parts that have uh, Cortex A and M, uh, as well as other cores. Um, does everybody know what Cortex M is about? Cortex A is about? Uh, well, A is, uh, they consider it application uh, processing. They're basically the very high speed, big cache, designed for running applications, things like Linux, like your cell phone. Uh, these are great processors. They churn through data. They've got a lot of performance. Uh, what they don't have is consistent and reliable uh, real-time performance. Uh, to make them go fast, they use caches and speculative execution and a variety of fancy things that make them uh, very speedy, but also uh, make it very hard to determine exactly how long it's going to take to do a certain task. Maybe it takes a little bit of time. One time, maybe it takes a lot of time. Some other time, you've got big pipelines and lots of lots of uh, uh, ambiguity, I suppose. Uh, the M families are not nearly as fast, but they're far more deterministic. Um, there's a lot of movement in the makerspace. Uh, uh, several folks who are moving away from the 8-bit Arduinos because they're running out of power uh, and they can't do enough calculations to, to, to meet their needs are moving to the Cortex M's. There are 32-bit processors to 8 bits. They run in the realm of 80 to maybe a couple of hundred megahertz instead of uh, like 20 megahertz. So substantially more performance than a, a microcontroller, but uh, um, still not what you're going to get from like a one and a half gigahertz type uh, application process. The nice part about having those on the same die is, uh, in addition to the power saving possibilities that they have for uh, things like the cell phones, uh, one of the reasons they like them, is you can also um, use them like a PRU. The, the Cortex-M is uh, not as high a performance as the PRU, but can be used very much the same way to offload timing critical aspects of the HAL to um, a processor particularly well suited for it, leaving the uh, computationally intense part that doesn't have to happen have to happen with quite such uh, latency constraints to the uh, higher speed application processor. Uh, in addition, there's DSPs and some other things I'll get into when we talk about the X15 a little bit. Um, another thing that I really like a lot that I'm seeing that's uh, uh, starting to become very prolific is the uh, CPU and FPGA combinations. And both Altera and Xilinx, who are the big FPGA vendors, um, have these available now. and Essentially, you have a system on chip. There's a, a typically a dual core ARM Cortex A series parts, um, anywhere from 700 to a gigahertz or so uh, operation operating frequency. All the standard ARM peripherals, uh, EMMC interfaces, SD RAM, uh, Ethernet, USB, all the sort of standard things you'd, you'd normally see on a on a single board computer. Um, but then you also have glued onto this uh, anywhere from uh, like 25,000 to hundreds of thousands of FPGA gates. And that allows a single chip, basically, to pull in the entire system of uh, what currently would be like an x86 system with a PCI Express bus and a hardware accelerated FPGA card doing your hardware interfacing. You can pull that all into one little chip. Uh, the chips are anywhere from, they start around 10 bucks or so. <clears throat> and they go up to uh, pretty expensive, depending on, some, some of them are gigantic. Um, but uh, it doesn't take much in the way of gates to do a very effective control of um, hardware, whether it's brushless DC motors or steppers or PWG. PWM generation or, or anything like that. Um, you're also starting to see um, uh, expansion buses uh, on some of the single board computers. Um, I have an X15. Actually, no, actually, that's I have an X15, but it doesn't have an expansion bus on it. It's not populated. Uh, but several of the ARM chips uh, now are coming out with uh, more traditional PC type expansion, including uh, SATA connectors um, and including PCI Express. Um, and once you've got PCI Express, you can plug in one of the PCI Express FPGA hardware cards just like you could uh, any traditional x86 system. Um, and then finally, like I said, field bus. Uh, I really like the field bus 
possibilities for uh, uh, for the future. So uh, on to details. Um, my favorite of all the new boards, I got that too, I suppose. My favorite of the PG boards is uh, the SOC DE0 Nano SOC, a lovely name. Um, that's what a Taiwani, Taiwanese company calls it. Uh, Atlas is what the Altura people call it. Um, that's this board. I'll pass this around. Be sure to touch the metal parts before you grab the rest of the board, please. I'd like it to work. <sighs> Sorry for those of you watching at home, you can't see the board. Um, it has a dual core arm. Uh, what I like about this particular board, it's got the 10th inch pin headers, which uh, makes it easy to connect um, just random hardware or prototype with. Uh, you don't have to make a circuit board. You don't have, have high density service mount connectors to, to tie to the IO pins. Um, it's got DDR RAM, a gigabit. It's got uh, gigabyte. It's got a gigabit ethernet interface. Um, and uh, there's actually Arduino space headers on there as well. So there's numerous off of the shelf um, shields you can get for the Arduinos where you could talk to um, stepper motors or LEDs or whatever it is that you want to talk to. Um, and uh, it, it's only a hundred bucks, like I said. It's, uh, that, I've been waiting for one of these to get to be a hundred bucks. I have several other boards here um, from Altera, based around Altera designs. One. Uh, this one's about $300, the socket. Um, it's a little more advanced, but it's missing the pin headers. And uh, you have to use one of these high density, high speed, controlled impedance service mount, design your own circuit board around it, expansion connectors. So less fun, certainly for the hobbyist market. And then uh, this board, which uh, is about a thousand dollar board. Um, it has the same expansion on it. Uh, also, this one has a PCI Express socket. You uh, some of the trend, some of the SOC FPGA parts have uh, high-speed serial transceivers uh, with which you can implement things like PCI Express or SATA, or uh, actually make uh, additional gigabit Ethernet, uh, 10 gig Ethernet, um, various other interfaces if uh, if you want to in the FPGA fabric. Um, there's also the uh, uh, Zinc from Silinx. It's a very similar uh, offering to the products from Altera. Uh, the Parallela board is also $99. Uh, the problem with it is it's awkward to interface to. Um, it has the it has some I/O, but it's again the high density surface mount flavored. Um, and a lot of these other boards are expensive, like I just went over. Um, one of the good things is uh, basically once any of these boards are supported. Uh, whether it's Xilinx or Altera, uh, once you've made some uh, FPGA logic to do motion control, <coughs> um, that's typically going to be in a uh, hardware programming language, uh, VHDL or Verilog. Uh, the interfaces on both of the systems are similar. They both have, uh, it's AXI, it's referred to, that's the essentially the standard ARM system on chip internal bus is AXI. Uh, so if you make an AXI uh, target the interfaces to some hardware that you write. You could implement that easily on Altera or on uh, Xilinx. And um, also, once you get it, get something, get Machine Kit up and running, uh, it'll be very, fairly straightforward to get that running on either uh, platform. Um, both the Zinc and the Altera SOC options have been out long enough now. Things like uh, U-Boot and Linux, Linux kernel. Um, now have mainline support for most of these um, chips. So if you can compile, you know, if you're compiling U-Boot and, and getting it working, uh, you're not applying pages of patches to get to get everything uh, up and running. So uh, anyway, that brings us to um, the final board I brought, which is the X15. And uh, I'll just leave this up here, and you can all come up and see it if you want. A uh, picture of it on the screen if you're at home. Uh, this is a very powerful board. It's the next board from the Beagle Board Organization, uh, which uh, actually has been making boards prior to the BeagleBone for many years before the BeagleBone became uh, uh, popular uh, or was even designed. They've been selling uh, the original Beagle board and then various uh, derivations of it. 
um, as inexpensive Linux development kits using TI processors. And the latest version is really far more of a desktop uh, powerhouse. Uh, one and a half gigahertz A15 cores. Um, it's a dual core system, so uh, right there you've got substantially more processing power than an existing BeetleBone or uh, the Raspberry Pi 2, uh, anything like that. Um, there are two C66 uh, floating point DSP cores on here. If you do uh, programming system signal design kind of stuff, you know what a C66 DSP core is. They'll do, um, that's 32, up to 32 fixed point float, uh, fixed point multiplies per clock at that 700 megahertz. Uh, and they do do floating point, although it's not, uh, it takes a couple of clocks to do floating point, not uh, into it. But you still have uh, many, many floating point multiplies per clock. They're very, very powerful for signal processing. Um, uh, which is helpful if you're doing um, motion control type things. Uh, in addition, there are two dual Cortex-M4 subsystems. Each subsystem has two Cortex-M4s, so there's four total M4 cores. Um, and uh, there's also two dual PRU cores, so twice as many PRUs as the BeagleBone um, four instead of the two PRUs that are on the BeagleBone. Um, lots of RAM, two gigabit ethernets, uh, lots of GPUs. Uh, so far, it looks like a better support for the GPUs than the Beagle Bone Black. Uh, it's yet to be seen if um, that will translate into an accelerated desktop that would be usable for the traditional machine kit uh, interfaces. Uh, it was highly likely that the, um, uh, the QT-based interfaces would work. Um, but you might not get a full X11 desktop. So, um, and there's also SATA and uh, PCI Express on the expansion connectors. So uh, there's still a possibility of hooking up uh, FPGA hardware to this. Uh, actually, to me, the FPGA hardware is about the only thing missing on this board for making it a very uh, excellent um, sort of academic research board. Uh, I see this working very well with HAL and trying to glue, uh, I'd like to see the uh, ROS, the Robot Operating System, um, have a ROS endpoint running on an X15 and uh, get some of the academic guys working on coding up things for the uh, DSPs and the PRUs and the Cortexes. Um, I think there a lot of stuff could be uh, done with this board that would be uh, difficult to do with a traditional x86 system. Um, <clears throat> also, I, I don't have it listed on here, but on the I.O. Uh, expansion headers, there are video, uh, there's video input buses. Um, this is one of the chips that just, just, it doesn't just have HDMI out, it has uh, some video inputs. And uh, the great thing about that is you can hook video cameras up with USB, but the video data that comes in is compressed and is high latency. Um, the compression uh, that's run in the little webcams is uh, it's pretty good, but uh, it's it makes the video hard to process if you're trying to do like pattern recognition and things. You have to uncompress it first, um, and also between the compression and the incompression, you typically have several frames of uh, latency. They typically use an MPEG type compression where you have inner field. Um, well, the <laughs> it's like the blocks that freeze and then they drop out. You know, <laughs> they uh, they. They don't send the entire field every time. They they move pieces of the field around. So, well, yeah, it's uh, so at any rate, it has direct raw video input. Which uh, again, if you're working in sort of an academic research type of environment, or you were trying to do um, a a vision control application, which Ross Ross is very well uh, suited for uh, vision control. They do a lot of uh, object and pattern recognition things like that. Um, having a video input that is high speed and also um, low latency so that you get the video and you can be analyzing the video and you know when it happened and it's not like, oh, it happened half a second ago. Um, it's like, oh, it happened, you know, like 10 or 20 milliseconds ago. Uh, that's a pretty big difference. So I think this is a great uh, platform for that and I'm hoping that uh, we can get it up and running and draw some of the uh, academic folks into helping us add more uh, cool things to do with Machine Kit. So, 
Uh, I've got a few references here. Um, Masonet and Pico Systems, where you can buy some hardware, some of the Altera boards. Teresic is who makes the little $99 uh, uh, board with the FPGA and the BeagleBoard X15. And I missed it into the slide presentation, but there's also, um, there's a gentleman, I don't remember the name, who has gotten the zinc board running um, with, I believe, can motors. Isn't that right? It was, it's on the machine kit Google list. Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, that's uh, that's very interesting. Um, both that it's running on the zinc and uh, that he's got can going. So, uh, any questions about any of those? Yes. Uh, regarding the uh, Nano Atlas board, how much five volt I have on the side? Five volt I/O. I don't think I don't think anything's five volt anymore. I'm not sure if the Arduino pins are five volt or not, but uh, um, generally uh, all modern chips are three point three volts unless you put external um, signal conditioning. So uh, let me see. I'm not sure if there's anything on here. I haven't looked at the designs for this yet. It doesn't really look like it. It's Altera. It's a firmware that. Uh, Board of that, uh, something like that board? Uh, yeah, uh, that's one of the things that I would, I'm would i wanting to do in a uh, general sense is uh, the HM2 uh, firmware, both the, the, the HAL level drivers are open source, obviously, GPL. Um, the FPGA code that runs in the chips is uh, dual licensed uh, BSD and GPL. Um, and uh, basically what's missing to get that working on a board like this is uh, just the register I have blue logic to convert an AXI bus, which is what's available right. on the, between the, the ARM and the and FPGA, and the, uh, uh, the code that uh, uh, Peter's written for uh, those items. There's also a little bit of low level stuff for, <coughs> he uses some of the Xilinx um, standard components that are part of the Xilinx libraries, but Altera has very similar stuff where you can implement it in regular, just generic HDL. Um, but no, that's one of the things I want to get um, uh, working. Um, just, I like to play with it and I do a PGA design for a living, so it's um, it's cool. Um, to me, um, these would be an awesome platform for uh, a company or mock or someone else uh, that was wanting to ship a motion control platform. <clears throat> you know, you make your own you know, black box. Right. Um, if you don't want a black box, if you want a uh, uh, attractive display, you're better off with a generic computer system, x86, or even one of the ARMs if you can get the GPU running. Uh, any G there's no GPUs on these uh, SOC right. plus you FPGAs. You have to build it with FPGA gates which is extremely expensive if you're talking 3D graphics acceleration. Um, getting a simple frame buffer where you can have a picture of this is fine, but having something that would provide that no, UI. I was just wondering about uh, the operation. But yeah, if you're talking about there's some remote display device, uh, these are perfect for, you've got dual cores, you can perfectly run Linux, you can put Hard machine control, hardwired safety stuff, and the FPGA gates, um, and you typically would want to build some isolation driver, whatever kind of logic around it, depending on what exactly you were you were talking to, uh, whether it was uh, uh, analog servos or uh, you know true servos of PWM or step or whatever. Um, no, these are these are a great black box control platform. Uh, but for it to become that, somebody has to still, you know, invest in the, in the development a little bit. Um, I, you know, I, I'm interested in taking something like this where I can say, hey, you can go buy one of these for 100 bucks, and getting some sort of proof of concept stuff running on it. I'm not sure that there's a big like, oh, everybody's going to take their 3D printers and start controlling them with these. Um, 
but it's, it's, it's just too cool not to do. <laughs> so <laughs> going back to, uh, uh, you know, I was asked uh, yesterday, you know, why, why do you do this open source stuff? It's like, well, it's, just, it's just too cool not to do it. I feel compelled to, to make it happen just, you know, just because you want to. So uh, that's the stuff that excites me. And uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, I guess I got tagged as like, oh, he's the guy that does the ARM stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just like to go off in a different direction than everybody else, and it happened to be this way today. <laughs> so, any other questions? Uh, yes. yes. Uh, have you already played around with the FPGA boards? Uh, created some ReachDL code for them, or uh, for these specific to machine kit, or just in general? Uh, in general, as well, I was wondering about like. Um, uh, creating the FPGA code, uh, do you need like a de uh, do it on on your desktop? Is are there um, okay, synthesizers? Oh, yeah. Okay, so have their, have their packages, and because of the proprietary nature of the chips, you're almost forced to use that company's package. They, they yeah. don't release the details of the internal architecture. Uh, so, yeah, so so to get to get started, if you wanted to design something for uh, for these boards, um, there are there there are different versions of the development tools available uh, that range in expense. Uh, uh, both uh, Altera and Xilinx have free versions that will target their lower end parts, including the ones with the SFCs and the FPGA. So you can download it's like four gigabyte a four gigabyte install. Run it on your. Um, they, they they at least run on Linux now. The development tools run on Linux or Windows, uh, but you need the manufacturer specific tool chain um, to to work with making anything for the FPGAs. Um, and then as far as the HDL code you would put into the FPGAs, um, I have a AXI register interface uh, working from a different project that I uh, need to pull some proprietary parts out of and uh, put some licensing into. And I, I've been meaning to do that, I just haven't um, yet. But uh, uh, I have some AXI register interface logic that will work on these type uh, devices that I'll be sharing. And the uh, HM2 code from uh, MesaNet is uh, open source and um, could be targeted to these uh, devices as well. So that, that's kind of the two big pieces. Is that that's the motion control part, or at least the start of, of something. You might want something different if you were doing a, a custom board for a specific application. Uh, but it's certainly enough to get started. And uh, I've got some register code that should let it uh, uh, talk to let it talk to the ARM chip and the OS and bootloader and things. The kernel uh, that's all becoming. Um, easy to do. You can build a mainline kernel now, preempt RT, it'll run on the Altera SOC. You can build a mainline U bootloader, it'll run. You just install Debian like you would on any other platform, and away you go. So uh, the pieces you need specifically for this are the FPGA side, and there's most of that's there. So uh, it just hasn't been all glued together yet. Thank you, Charles. All right. Thank you.